Welcome to Jewelry Design and Sketching. My name is Robert Ackerman and I'm going to be your teacher, prof and coach all wrapped up into one throughout this course. I'm a traditionally trained goldsmith and gemologist with more than a third of a century in the trade. During this period, I've been conceptualizing and designing, product developing, researching, building and fabricating, altering and repairing, setting stones, identifying and valuing stones and jewelry, buying and selling retail and wholesale, managing a small specialty business, exhibiting at trade and trunk shows, teaching any combination of the above, while I myself have made it my objective to still be learning something new each day, because that's what makes it all worthwhile. Having grown up in Zurich, Switzerland, I've been privileged to have learned my trade from the very best of the post-Bauhaus period. I was fortunate to be embedded in the famed dual education system that is so much talked about. The dual education system brings together theory and practice, classroom practices and experience at the workplace, and its success in various industries is widely regarded as unparalleled. Over the years, I've run my own studio and won International Jewelry Design Awards. I've been teaching for over two decades, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share my know-how with you now. And who might you be? Truth be told, I've designed this course on the basis of popular demand. Over the years, I've been approached by so many people from every conceivable background, be they from the trade, intending to enter the trade, or just plain curious and wanting to know more about it. No matter how these inquiries were phrased, they would always boil down to something like, where can I learn to design and sketch jewelry? I can't spend so and so many weeks away from home or work to go to a trade school that's out of town. So what are my options? For anyone who has asked these questions and is watching this video, I can reply most emphatically that these videos were designed for you with the sole objective to provide you with a solid foundation that will allow you to move forward in any conceivable direction in your career. More specifically, I would expect you to be a fine jewelry designer or a CAD designer, maybe a costume jewelry designer or a goldsmith, a sales associate expert or specialist, a student enrolled in a jewelry design class or an intern or trainee, a student enrolled in a jewelry manufacturing class, a manufacturing intern or trainee, a manager, head of department or similar corporate decision maker, even a business owner, maybe an art student, a jewelry lover or a jewelry aficionado, a potential jewelry consumer seeking more involvement in the creative aspect, or a knowledge-starved student of life. Product development in every industry begins with a reaction to a need identified, an idea. By definition, an idea is a method of problem solving, aka innovation in business speak. At its initial stage, any idea is likely to be fuzzy and out of focus to some degree. Sketches fulfill a number of tasks. They help bring an idea into clearer focus, be it on a conceptual level, be it to get a handle on how to approach one of those nagging little details that need working out. Perhaps you need to address a potential challenge you're expecting further downstream. And then it's about sharing the idea at the earliest of stages prior to committing further resources. Well. What might it look like, at least approximately? What costs can I expect to incur? Is it viable? And am I ready to move on to the next stage? Am I ready to commit further resources? Does everybody involved have a clear picture and are they ready to move on? Do we need to address questions or objections of customers, corporate decision makers or goldsmiths first? Can it be integrated into my brand? Is it what the client is looking for? Further down the line, you might even bump into obstacles like, do I have the tooling or will I need to fall back on outside resources? If so, which ones? And they'll bring us back to the question about cost. The concept is a winner, but I need to come up with variations. Where do I go from here? From this line of questions, you can see that sketching is about addressing a product's function as well as its appearance, but also the way it is produced, marketed and costed. These are the considerations that distinguish design from art. 
My experience in dealing with the above, everyday considerations is one of the guiding principles behind every frame of video. Another is about providing you with a technique that serves as a point of departure for creating visuals that read well and are quicker and easier to make with time and practice. A third guiding principle is to remain as low-tech as possible. To put it another way, these videos are not about precision rendering, nor will you learn to make glamorous colored renderings like this one here. They take hours in addition to their own techniques using watercolor and gouache. I would have loved to include art and jewelry history for the simple reason that their subject is so enlightening. But since this would reach far beyond the scope of our original objectives, I've chosen to leave it for another day. If there is one item I consider counterproductive to the extreme, it is a monocultural, single-branded and unidimensional approach. While such an approach may appear to be quick and easy at the outset, it will become apparent very soon that your newly acquired tools for innovation are quite limited indeed. In this first set of 11 videos, we'll be drawing in the top-down view only. Specifically, each one will discuss the orientation you're watching, drawing straight lines, drawing curved lines or curves, the fundamentals of guides, applications of guides, drawing stone outlines, drawing facet lines, bead setting, the fundamentals of pavé, advanced pavé and drawing complex outlines. Obviously, freehand sketching doesn't end there. There are the glamour views or perspective drawings that are so essential in closing a sale or the mechanical sketches for those involved in where things are actually made. Then there's the shading and coloring to bring a visual full circle. These will go online pursuant to popular demand. A friend of mine and one of Alaska's leading architects once observed that there was nothing like the sense of creative freedom he gets from picking up a pencil when there's a sheet of paper in front of him. In my humble opinion, that statement kind of cuts to the chase. From my personal experience, I've learned that you need to be able to draw from the hip quite literally. Whether you're brainstorming alone with a customer or a superior, a desktop full of instruments and utensils, triangles, templates, paints and brushes, tends to distract from the task at hand. More often than not, the ship will have already sailed. I've created more opportunity for myself by grabbing a stray pencil, poaching a sheet of paper from the nearest printer, even using the back of an envelope from the recycling bin, and the few minutes of attention my opposite was willing to grant me in their own busy day. Not as glamorous as what you see in the movies, I'll admit, but then it's the real thing. And indeed, all you'll really need by the time you hit the play button to the next video is a mechanical pencil or a lead holder, lead or graphite, two kinds of paper, an eraser and adhesive tape. And that's it for the materials. You'll also need to set up a workspace. Make sure it's free of distractions like a blaring TV or disturbances like people squeezing through behind your back and bumping into your elbows. All you'll need is a desk of adequate height and standing stable, a chair that's comfortable, preferably an office chair with adjustable height, and good lighting. But let's go over each item in detail so you know what to look for. We'll be using a mechanical pencil, also known as a lead holder, for half millimeter leads. Mechanical pencils are so affordable and accessible, you can acquire any amount of them and tuck away backups in even the remotest nooks and crannies of your work territory, ready for action any time. Now, you might think that half millimeter leads are a little on the heavy side. After all, you're rendering jewelry and not larger items. But the next size down, 0.3 millimeters, is so thin that your hand's natural dynamic range of pressure is likely to overpower and break them on a frequent basis. Today, by the way, the term lead has become something of a misnomer. Apparently, the use of lead in pencils has become a thing of the past. All pencil leads are made of polymer-bound graphite platelets of varying hardness. Your mechanical pencil is likely to come with graphite that is rated HB which is the middle of the hardness scale and ranges from 9H for the hardest to 9B for the softest. HB is great for writing, but it can smear. Instead, go out and buy a box of half millimeter 2H 
hard graphites. And replace the HB graphite in your mechanical pencil with these. Worried about keeping a half millimeter sufficiently sharp at all times? If you make it a habit to turn your pencil every few strokes, it becomes essentially self-sharpening. In any event, it handsomely meets the requirements for our purposes. With regards to paper, you'll need two kinds. For the first kind, any smooth white paper will do. For filming the videos, I resorted to white cardstock for the simple reason that nothing will shine through from what's underneath, so it will create the greatest contrast on camera, making the drawings easier to read. That said, you could also take a plain sheet of printing paper and fold it in half for a double layer of consistent, unmodified white. The other thing we're looking for in our white paper is the fiber, or rather the lack thereof. Your graphite tip is easier to control on a smooth surface. While you'll be doing most of your work on white paper, you'll need transparent paper for some jobs. However, you want to stay away from the run-of-the-mill tracing paper. Commercially available tracing paper comes apart after a few encounters with the eraser, and you'll most decidedly need to use the eraser as you start out. Instead, look for transparent paper vellum of some kind or another. Vellum is made of cotton fiber and quite smooth, so your graphite tracks just sweet. A thin kind of vellum is sold for printing on inkjet printers. It's called inkjet vellum. It is quite resilient to erasing and wonderfully transparent, so underlying images show well and are easy to trace. Quality vellum will cost more than tracing paper, but then it looks the part too. You won't be mistaken for scribbling on just any old rag, which is kind of important when you're working one-on-one -on -one with customers. As you start up, you'll find yourself becoming very close to your eraser, although it's likely to be one of those highly ambiguous relationships. Although I didn't list it as a necessity, it's a good idea to have some rough sandpaper like 120 grit on hand. Use it to remove excess graphite from your eraser when it's so overpowered and saturated with graphite that all you get is smearing. You can also resuscitate an old eraser in mere seconds by sanding away the outer layer of oxidized rubber that won't do much of anything but smear either. Finally, you'll need a roll of tape to keep your paper from skidding around when you don't want it to. Masking tape or scotch tape will do just fine if it's 3 quarter inch or 19 millimeters wide. And that's it for the materials. Kind of anticlimactic, I'd say. It's well under $20 worth of supplies. But then sketching is about skills, not gadgets. And with that, let's talk about your workspace. Be sure your desk is of an adequate height. If you're either very short or very tall, the standard height of 76 centimeters or 30 inches may need some adjusting. Make sure your desk doesn't wobble, and especially that it's not standing in a place where there's more traffic than inside a beehive. As to the surface of the table, it should be absolutely smooth. As mentioned earlier, working against a pristine white background is best. Nothing wrong with a dark surface that two to three sheets of printing paper or a single sheet of accordingly thicker white paper couldn't fix. And a little bit of give from the paper below doesn't hurt either. Of course you'll also need a chair. It doesn't have to be fancy, but it should be built well enough for you to be able to sit in for hours if need be. You will need to be able to adjust the height to where you are sitting with a straight spine and able to maintain a comfortable focal distance to the work on the table in front of you. If you are sitting too high, you will find yourself hunching over to compensate for an excessive focal distance and a lack of support of your elbows. Inevitably, you'll tense up and get a backache or a headache, eventually ending in a roaring migraine. If you are sitting too low, your elbows might have adequate support, but your eyes will strain to focus on your drawings, which can be just as debilitating. A word about your eyes. If you are wearing prescription contacts or glasses, are they up to date? Monitor yourself on this issue. You wouldn't be the first person to find that they are selling themselves short because of inadequate support to their vision. Last, but definitely not least, your light source represents a major workspace ingredient. Ordinary incandescent light bulbs have a way of producing hard shadows from your pencil and your hand, which you may find hard on the eyes. Incandescent lighting can also reflect off the paper, causing excessive glare. 
Fluorescent lighting, on the other hand, is more diffused. There is less contrast between light and shade, and the glare is less blinding. However, it may have flicker, which is distracting and tiring. Be absolutely sure to eliminate flicker by whatever means necessary. I'll be working with a mix of daylight, I'm in sunny Southern California where it never rains, and an energy-saving fluorescent light source throughout. It's bright, it's diffused, and it's green. There's a simple little trick to be ahead of excessive shadows and excessive glare. Being right-handed, place the light source at the top and left of your drawing, making sure the light is pointing toward it and there are no shadows visible from the top anymore. Fine-tune the light direction so that whatever glare you get will reflect off the paper and past your eyes, making it easy to go for hours without fatigue. If you're left-handed, the answer is simple. Just mirror that very setup. Today's online learning options are a fabulous tool. I'm sure you'll agree they make the typical restrictions of time and place a matter of the past. You can go over a lecture at your pace and whenever is convenient, review it at your leisure and not feel pressured to do so when other obligations take precedence. But more about that in a while. How do you get the most from these videos? Watch each one closely and in chronological order. Make sense of what is being discussed. Pause and review as needed. Reflect and go back to the parts you need to review. Each lecture builds upon the previous one in a methodical manner, so you don't want to start out just anywhere. There will be parts in every video that are designed to just watch with an analytic mind and eye. Other parts are designed for you to look at and then roll up your sleeves to get into the action yourself. In any event, I'll let you know every time. At the end of every video, I will make specific practice and project assignment suggestions for you to practice. Sketching is not what I'd call a skill acquired from watching alone. To every video lecture, there's an according, downloadable portable document file, or PDF, for your convenience. The first segment lists the video's contents and the start time of every segment for easy navigation. The section, What to Take Home, summarizes the essential points of the video lecture, and last but not least, the Practice and Project Assignments section lists the same suggestions as seen in the final section of every video, with the exception of this introductory one, where it relists the few supplies you'll want to get before moving on to the next lecture. You'll find some practice suggestions more appealing than others. Cherry-pick the ones that are fun. Perhaps you have your own idea for practice, or perhaps you can put what you've learned to good use right away on a given job. If you're serious with your aspirations in sketching, the word is, the more, the merrier. You will progress faster if you draw a little every day, rather than spending half a day at it every other week. 15 minutes over lunch hour, or 15 minutes after supper, perhaps sometimes both, that will get you places. Sometimes you will get a grasp of things very quickly and be ready to move on almost instantaneously. Other times you may find you need to review it. And one thing. Remember, you are drawing by hand. Have reasonable expectations of yourself. In a world where everything you see in graphic presentation is of computer-generated perfection, it is easy to feel inadequate when you're learning to draw freehand. Know yourself. You may be the kind of person that does better taking a tentative stroll through each video and then reviewing in a selective manner. Someone else might hold themselves to a minimum standard before moving on. No matter what your nature, the beauty of having videos at your disposal is that you can review anything specific at any time. And that's it for our first video, folks. No project assignment for this one. But make sure you get your materials and set up your workspace so you're functional before actually rolling up your sleeves and moving on to the next video. In the meantime, be sure to sample this.